Welcome to the Motivity State Podcast, the space where we dive into mobility, movement, biomechanics, neurology, and much, much more. Hello and welcome to episode three of the Motivity State Podcast. As you probably know, my name is Rado and my guest today is my friend and colleague uh, Galina Denzel. Uh, I'll let her introduce herself in just a bit. Uh, in the meantime, uh, as usual, I want to share uh, a bit of it, a, a bit of background information of how I uh, I met her and um, and our personal story. Um, I've been following her for over ten years now, uh, back from the days when she was still in Bulgaria and coaching over here. Uh, eventually, I ended up at one of her uh, workshops uh, teaching restorative uh, movement and exercise uh, over here in Sofia. And ever since, she has been my uh, my mentor in a way of um, of showing me um, different perspectives, guiding me to some of my other mentors uh, whom I've learned from. Because she's like at least. 10 to 15 years ahead of ahead of me in terms of like development and practice and all that. So I hope today's uh, talk will be interesting. Again, uh, it will involve a, a little more than just movement. And uh, without further ado, Galina, tell us more about yourself. Oh, it's so good to be here. And um, you know, in many ways, Rado, we are in the future. You know, like when we met each other, you know, 10-ish years ago or, or whenever that was. Um, you know, I, I love looking back and seeing how we've all, oh, apologies. There's a, a timer that says, don't forget to come to this podcast, but it's a real <laughs> Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we're kind of in the future. We're in the future. We've been walking our paths and it's just so beautiful to kind of be together and talk about it. Um, maybe the easiest way for me to introduce myself is, is to say I work with people on a daily basis to support them through uh, different experiences that are bringing them healing from various kinds of suffering, whether it's physical pain or emotional, mental, psychological pain. And I started in my early 20s as a personal trainer. And I thought I would work with uh, pre and perinatal women for the rest of my life. Really, like, you know how in our 20s, we like, we have no idea what we don't know yet. <laughs> yeah. so I was like, here I'm in my mid 20s and I'm working with pregnant women and I love it. And I'm just going to be a movement professional for the rest of my life and just help women deliver these healthy babies and feel great um, and transition in this big, big, this big phase of their life. And I was really interested in transitions. And back then in my 20s, I'm 41 now, I had no idea why I was so interested in transitions. But I love teaching. I went to school, my university degrees in English. I wanted to be a teacher. I've always been a natural teacher and I've always loved teaching. And I came into movement through dance. I was a dancer. Then I, I came more into kind of fitness and, and exercise for health. Uh, and over time came into exercise for spe special populations and people who have pain and uh, who weren't helped by traditional medicine and um, even traditional PT, right? And so uh, I, I thought I would work with pregnant women for the rest of my life. And then little by little, I started seeing how much broader and bigger that was and how many people needed relief from pain, how many people needed to bring their uh, movement culture and movement intelligence back online and how much as a culture we had lost it. And around at that time, I met Katie Bowman, um, who's the um, creator of Nutritious Movement, which back then was called Restorative Exercise. And Katie really helped me uh, give words to things that I was feeling for so many years, but I had no container for. And so it was really beautiful to, to be able to teach a modality of movement that was both healing and respectful to the body. Um, and that also really... Um, helped kind of reawaken our connection to ourselves and our connection to nature. And it was somewhere in kind of my first or second year of, of being with Katie that I felt for the first time that my, my body was kind of um, unconsciously 
holding all these tension patterns. And I knew about trauma and I knew about pain and I knew about the unconscious piece, but I kind of knew about it over there. I didn't know about it in my body. So experiencing these kind of unconscious ways in which I was holding myself in an opposite way of how I actually wanted to feel was kind of a, was kind of a, a, an opening to say, okay, I want to know more. I want to know more about why we move the way we move and why we do what we do. And there's many different paths that you can take. I'm a little bit of a nerd. So I took as many of them at the same time as I could. So I went really, really deep into muscle testing and figuring out like these really intricate ways of, you know, figuring out what's working and what's not and how to rewire it back. And um, that's how I found Anatomy in Motion and how I found Gary Ward. And um, it was just so beautiful to be with so many modalities, but kind of holding this idea of, okay, our body naturally tends towards healing. How do we remove the barriers to it? And how do we support it to have new experiences? And I found myself, even though I was a good enough movement professional, uh, I found myself in my private practice in Southern California, working with a population where I was way over my head. I was just not prepared to work with a population that had so much trauma and such complex history of both shock trauma, <clears throat> which is kind of things like um, medical procedures and surgeries and car accidents and falls and natural disasters, uh, wars and developmental trauma, which are things that happen or don't happen when we're developing in our family of origin. And so I myself had a beautiful healing experience with somatic experiencing. And so I started with um, learning somatic experiencing to help my clients who are in pain. And, and that kind of started the next phase of my journey. So in my 20s, I was really focused on fitness, really focused on performance. Then little by little towards my late 20s, I became very interested in healing and health and improving movement quality and, and kinesthetic intelligence. And then by, by my 30s, I was like, okay, trauma is the next frontier. So I've been at this quite a long time now. Um, and I would say after completing several different programs that support you in becoming a, a trauma practitioner, I have kind of found my way. And I feel like both for myself and for my family, um, for my clients and the people I support now, I've been able to create something out of all the things I've learned. And I'm continuing to learn, as you know, it never ends when you're responsible for um, supporting others. You're always, always growing, always healing yourself, parallel to everyone you're working with. And, and so today, my practice is um, more around healing the nervous system and supporting people uh, with uh, who have different challenges in nutrition and emotional eating and also physical pain. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of coming at it with a little bit of a different angle. And it's more of a, it's more of a broader, more holistic approach instead of saying, oh yeah, let's just, you know, load your vastus medialis and everything's going to be fine. Uh, but, but kind of seeing the complexity, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like seeing the complexity of how many entry points we have into a complex system and really respecting that. Yep. And I can, I can totally relate about the, the path of like starting from uh, the broad like fitness industry and movement and everything because like in the beginning people, uh, our brains on a cognitive level uh, find it easier to understand through movement. But then when we go to the emotional stuff and the trauma and all those experiences, people hold it in the back of their head like they don't want to feel vulnerable, they don't want to share to through whatever reasons or they don't see the connections between their muscle tension for example or neurological patterns that are holding them back and the emotions and all the all the stuff that they've been dealing with uh, mm -hmm. on their own so it's uh, oftentimes i see probably because of the ways we're we're uh, raised or uh, um, especially over here in, in bulgaria you have to be tough you have to uh, not share your weaknesses and all those kind of things and uh, people find it hard to to look for support so it, it's great when when actually they open up to somebody like you or some other practitioner and, and and they're able to really heal after suffering for so long and and also with pain um 
you said that you're healing the nervous system. I'm, I'm currently at a level where like, I'm really interested in to apply neurology. And because I, uh, as you said, in, in California, you were uh, feeling um, uh, way over your head. And with myself, it's like uh, the, the not knowing how to help a certain person would push me to look for answers. And it, it, the, the, it's a gradual process and it's a natural process of going to the next level, going to the next level. And then it's, it's also a very fulfilling um, mm. uh, sensation when you're actually, you said you're, you're an educator, you felt you, you were a natural educator and I can confirm because the way you present the information for, because I've learned from you and attended your uh, our workshops and we've talked a lot uh, on a personal uh, level. The way you present the information, the the the, the um, complex information, the way you simplify it, the, the, your tone of voice and your communication skills are, are like a, a, re, a real teacher, like by by nature. So I confirm that. Uh, but then also it's very um, fulfilling when you actually create something yourself because you said uh, those different modalities modalities on their own they could be helpful but you have to have your own system your your own mixture of tools and, and depending on the person on the on the issue on the trauma or whatever because like you cannot just learn neurology and start applying neurology to to everyone you cannot just learn like uh, uh, biomechanics and start applying but knowing when to apply what is what makes the difference and wh what actually creates the, the healing experience at, at least that's my my uh, my experience so yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. And and you do that masterfully yourself, right? Yep. And I, yep. I, I think there's a there's a dedication to um our our students to to just you know con continue on that path of discovery ourselves and then to keep distilling and bringing to them what might have taken you 10 years to figure out in 10 minutes. Exactly. Um, which is which is what an exceptional teacher does. Um and it's just so beautiful to see you develop that um yeah and and there's no <laughs> there's no shortcuts i wish there were yeah can you can you share uh, because for many people uh including myself since I, since i haven't gone to the depths of like the somatic uh, experience and, and somatic practices um can you give us a broad idea of what it is and how how it works and how it could be useful or helpful for, for, for people, for clients who want to look help or who are looking for help? Sure, sure. So you can think of the different modalities that work with the body um, from... You, you can kind of look at the somatic modalities as this big family of modalities. And within them, we have things such as Feldenkrais or uh, Hanna somatics or things like continuum movement or body-mind centering. Or we also have things like somatic experiencing and sensory motor psychotherapy. Um, and it's important when we look at all of those to see that some of them emerged out of movement, like Feldenkrais, and some of them emerged out of um, solving problems, <laughs> challenges that traditional psychotherapy could not. And so it's very important to see that they, they have different lineages, these practices but they all come to converge in the body as a way to liberate ourselves from the past and to make the future possible, which is really beautiful. And I, I'm personally trained as a somatic experiencing practitioner. So I'm gonna to speak to somatic experiencing, which was created by Peter Levine. And somatic experiencing is a modality that is mostly practiced by psychotherapists I would say a very small percentage of others who practice uh, SC are body workers or movement um, professionals or coaches. And when a psychotherapist comes to study somatic experiencing, when a body worker comes to study somatic experiencing, we come to go under and into the foundation of what drives human behavior and essentially what makes you human. And the reason a, a therapist might come to this is because they're doing talk therapy, 
but clients have needs that are connected to the body and to the autonomic nervous system, which is an unconsciously functioning system. And unlike talk therapy, where kind of top down, you can bring a lot of organization in the body just through cognition or through connection and relationship, when the body is disorganized by trauma or is still acting as if the dangerous or scary thing, the overwhelming thing that happened is still happening, then those tools are not enough. And you have to actually work bottom up. You have to organize the system in a way that um, it can kind of flow again. It can kind of join the original movement of life. So you can think of somatic experiencing as a modality that allows us as practitioners to sit with a person and in a conversation, observe where they are in their nervous system. Just like when you're doing an anatomy in motion assessment, you can see whether you know, someone has a particular movement lacking or a particular movement happening somewhere that it normally shouldn't occur. And so you know, everyone knows about fight and flight. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows about freeze and rest and digest, right? These are kind of like these basic states of the autonomic nervous system. And us as practitioners can sit with somebody and very quickly know where their nervous system is in that moment or where is their kind of home base where they live most of the time. And when somebody comes in and has a particular symptom because people don't care about the autonomic nervous system. They don't care about applied neurology. They want their back pain gone or their stomach issues gone or their emotional eating gone, right? Like people are very uh, motivated by, by symptoms. Yep. So when somebody comes with a cluster of symptoms like, oh, I have insomnia and also have digestive issues. And I also feel like I can never rest. Like I can't lay on the couch and rest. My mind just keeps going that gives me some information about where their nervous system might be stuck. And so there are particular practices that we do in order to move somebody to give the system enough information so it can get organized and it can move from one state to another. So like in the stress response cycle, what happens is our body meets a stressor. The fight or flight system needs to engage because we need energy in order to move out of a threatening situation then the system engages and we get a lot of energy in the body but then eventually when the dangerous situation is over we can relax now if you come to work with me and we see that your system is kind of stuck in creating these um, actions doing these behaviors whether they're physical behaviors or they're uh, mental emotional states or even thought patterns that go with being in a phase of the stress response cycle as if it's still happening, but now we're looking around and you're just like in the office with me or you're in your own bedroom, clearly your system is doing something that is not appropriate for the time right now. It's not reflecting, right? Our system is not coherently reflecting what's actually happening around which can end up in extreme exhaustion, right? Because if my system's running on high all the time, like if my car is running on 3000 RPMs at a traffic light, right? It's going to cause some issues. Mm -hmm. So people come with symptoms, but oftentimes these symptoms are being driven by a state of the nervous system that the person is stuck in. And so our work is to practice and do particular um, physical practices Um, or sometimes it can be um, guided um, practices that people do with us Mm -hmm. in order to, um, in order to give the system enough information about what's actually happening right now. So it can complete the stress response cycle and it can move into the next phase where it gets tricky is that some people have such complex histories that the system is now has decided that what is the safest and what is the best is to stay there. So whether you're stuck in a kind of fight or flight response and can't complete the stress response cycle, so there's a lot of energy in the body, a lot of tension, 
a lot of charge and you can't complete that. It's always in your body. Or you're more stuck in the kind of higher threat response, which is the freeze response and everything's kind of shut down and unbounded and the system is kind of lifeless and doesn't have energy and metabolism is really low, oxygen consumption is really low. If your system has decided that this is what's safest for you, it's not going to be quick, right? Like it's not gonna be like, hey, one session and done to, to shift that state um, because there's a lot of adaptations and some of them have been going on our whole lives to, um, to kind of keep us safe. And so showing the system a new way to be safe, which movement comes in as a beautiful uh, support here is, uh, is really, really important. So you can think of um, somatic experiencing as the model that helps us see where the nervous system is stuck and that gives us the tools to complete these cycles and be out of them. Kind of like a whole bunch of programs on your computer that are not closed and they're looping in the background and they're taking a lot of CPU and we can just go force quit them. <laughs> gentle force quit them yeah <laughs> not, not forceful force quit them and and we can give the body the 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 bandwidth now to experience what's actually happening right now which is a lot more appropriate and and sometimes people have this misunderstanding about uh, somatic experiencing or other trauma healing modalities that the goal is to be calm <laughs> the goal is to be in rest and digest and that's not the goal the goal is to be appropriate so if my body is stuck in a freeze response and I'm, I'm, everything's kind of shut down and I'm in conservation mode and there's conflict, I don't have energy to meet that conflict. Or if I'm stuck in kind of a fight or flight space, but there's nothing happening around that's dangerous, then my system can't rest. So whether you can't meet the demands and conflict and stand up for yourself and you know, fight for what's right, which requires energy, or you can't get out of that fight or flight, it, it's still an inappropriate response to the environment. So the goal is to be flexible. The goal is to have access to all of our states. And we might move into you know, a temporary freeze, come out of it, be in a fight or flight, come out of it, come into rest and digest and connect um, and, and this is where I, I think there's such a misunderstanding that the goal is to fix these responses because they're wrong. They're not wrong. We just don't want to be stuck in one that's for 1984, right? <laughs> Even that now it's 2021. We want to make sure that we're living our present lives and we are in the present with present responses. Instead of I'm sitting here with you March 17th and what's running in me is like another podcast that I was on five years ago that was in some way overwhelming you know yeah, yeah. does that make sense yeah, yeah to totally and and i com and i completely agree because this makes sense also for movement because a, a lot of the uh still i mean i don't understand it but people still believe about the perfect posture and sitting upright and all those kind of things pulling the shoulders back and down and all those kind of like uh cliches that build up and been promoted in the fitness industry for decades now and uh, just like with what you, what you were just saying, when a person comes to me or when I teach somebody or in a corporate setting, it doesn't matter. I keep talking about nothing. There's no right or wrong movement. It's can you go in and out of the position? And that's what matters to me because this will allow the body to experience both ends of the spectrum. And as well with... Uh, with uh, with the emotions and uh, uh, another myth that or another idea ha that has been uh, uh, promoted over the last probably decade about happiness and about positive thinking and all those kind of things and which I, I think are absurd because people should be able because I've worked with like psychologists myself and I I've, I've went through, I, I went through that path myself and then I got to understand that. Uh, there's no good or bad emotions. There's just emotions. And then you, you shouldn't get stuck in one for too long or entertain the, the negative or the positive emotions for, for so long. Because again, uh, something else is going on all the time and you don't have the capacity to, to address it in, a, in an appropriate way, as you said. So it goes for both for emotions, for movement, for pretty much everything. But the hard, the hard part, I guess, is uh, learning what we have been programmed for um, for so many years or just because of generations of like 
passing on the knowledge or the, the practice or whatever, because, you know, over here, they say uh, mothers or grandmothers are continue cooking the same kind of food over and over and over and pass it on to generations. It doesn't mean they didn't have the understanding. They didn't have the, the produce that we have now. They didn't have the, uh, the knowledge about mixing foods and how it, uh, how it, uh, it works with our health system, with the well, gut and, uh, and immune, immune system and all that stuff. They didn't care. They were more worried about like surviving and they were living in different times and now things are different. So uh, I guess that's, that's the hardest part for me. I mean, from what I see. Yeah, of course. And, and you know what's the hardest is you can't change what you don't see. Mm. You, even if you want to, you can't change what you're not aware of. And, and this is where it's very useful to work with a practitioner and be guided so that you can access what you can't. And one really cool thing that we, we do in somatic experiencing is we work with movement, work with behavior, we work with thinking, we work with sensation, what you experience in your body, and we work with emotion. And so we work with all five of them. <clears throat> so say if you've had a traumatic experience and your body is stuck in this kind of overwhelm, maybe you have access to the physical sensations or the tension or the, you know, interrupted digestion, but you don't have access to anything else. You don't even know what that's related to. You have forgotten a long time ago and that forgetting is an intelligent function. Hmm. And so when we don't have story, we have symptoms. And what, what a practitioner can help you do that's trained in somatic experiencing is to create this coherent narrative where we can have the physical experience, but then we also have a mental experience. We can have an emotional experience. We can have a relational experience. And when the, the, our brain wants the whole story and when it doesn't have it, it'll make it up. And so it's really, really important to be giving the whole story so that we can move through that can get integrated, the past can get integrated, and we can now live more in the present. And what's really cool, and, and a modality that does beautiful work with this is organic intelligence created by Steve Hoskinson. And it's kind of, uh, Steve was my uh, first year somatic experiencing practitioner uh, teacher. And, and I learned so much from Steve. What they do so well in OI is they don't even go to work with the trauma or the story. All they do is they invite the system to just kind of organize itself. They look for movements that come up or words that come up or images that come up. And then those that are helpful, those are the ones that they work with. Because in, in, in trauma, there's this understanding of like, we have to go for the hard stuff and like really do some serious trauma work. <laughs> and the reality is the body's constantly self-organizing and it wants to be better. And when you can find those openings just like in movement right oh wow look a bigger breath came great let's ride that and let's see what's next so there's there's many beautiful modalities that that do that well um yeah i can talk about this for hours so you let me know what's next i i have a, i have a couple notes about what you said about uh, recognizing uh, the emotions the movements uh, everything like uh, that you work with and I've seen that something that which people neglect uh, when they work with themselves is keeping a journal. I don't know if you use that for, for your clients, but like it's a very practical tool to write down how you felt after doing X. And then, you know, in, after doing uh, Y, Z, whatever. And then because you can come back and see, hey, I did this and this reflected into uh, me having like bloated stomach or if we talk nutrition or if we talk emotions, I ate that food when I was feeling sad or overwhelmed or whatever. So it's a really practical tool because we can always go back to it and start seeing patterns. And uh, it goes back to what you said about not knowing what you don't understand and what you don't see. Because one of the things I've done, I, I haven't really profiled and worked a lot with nutrition uh, with clients, but sometimes when they approach me I do help out um, uh, I have them write down the foods they eat for the for five days straight and then I start we start working with their uh, nutritional patterns and everything because this way sometimes they see the patterns themselves before even we start working together so this is very helpful and then they're more aware about their um, 
their habits. And another thing uh, that you said about the body self-organizing, I think it's super important to mention because uh, a lot of our, uh, a lot of trainers, practitioners, like medical professionals, they uh, driven out of ego, I guess, they, um, they believe that they are fixing people, talk about fixing people and, and take all the credit. And um, Gary, uh, Gary, yourself and some of my other trainers uh, keep repeating the same thing, giving the system new experiences and new options to move or to feel or to experience and then let the system reorganize itself. That, that's, pre- what, what, that's what I keep telling my clients. Like I, we check if this and this and this is in, in check, is, in, is working. And then if it's not, we try to improve it. And then the, your nervous system or, or your brain muscles, everything, all the systems are smart enough to go back communicating with each other and, and for you to feel better pretty much. Uh, you don't want to take all the credit. And then uh, something that you said also, you you said that people want the back pain or the knee pain, whatever, gone. But I believe that it's very important you probably do it yourself as well. You also go into details, try to rationalize it for them. On, so for them to first understand it on the cognitive level, because this is step one, because in the beginning for them, it's for, for all of them, it's more abstract because they haven't had the experience in, in their body. So they understand it on a cognitive level, but still they will be more motivated to to do the stuff or to work with themselves on their own time and be more dedicated when they work with you or or me or somebody else when they know why they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I think this is something that I mean, some people should also address and I believe it's important to mention. It's really important in in all healing work, but it's... um indispensable for trauma healing because we know from research that when we do good psychoeducation and people understand the autonomic responses and what's happening in their bodies they feel so empowered to do the practices that are helpful um, and feel so motivated to support their system because one thing that's really tricky and really scary is, you know, the the autonomic system is autonomic, which means you can't do anything about it. That's the premise. I can't do anything about it. It's just happening to me. I'm having a panic attack. I'm emotionally eating. I'm out of my body, right? There's nothing I can do. My body just does this. I, I can't go into a supermarket or I can't be in my car and drive after the accident. And it really feels like it's happening to you. And there's nothing you can do. The reality is that when people understand, start to understand the symptoms and we slow things down because one of the the kind of hallmarks of trauma is there is not enough time and everything feels really compressed. So when we slow things down and we can work slower and it's the, the body can actually have space for everything that's happening, because a panic attack is just a lot of energy compressed, right? So if we can make space and you can start to discern what's difficult about the situation and you can help yourself because there's particular practices you can do to help yourself, all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, my body is doing all these things and they're not happening to me. We're actually partners in this and I can meet my body. And in that meeting, there's a calming down. Oh, I'm having these thoughts there's things you can do with the thoughts that you're having. It doesn't mean they're true, right? You can't just let them spiral. Like we can't let our thoughts just do whatever the heck they want to do because we're all going to end up depressed by the end of the week, right? It's, it's really, really important to, uh, to know that we are active participants even when autonomic processes are happening. Yes, they are. And we can understand what they are and we can partner and we can support ourselves. And, and this is where um, I've had so much hope in my own body with my own symptoms. And I see my students daily. And that's why I teach the way I teach. And I've created a curriculum where, you know, we have 50% lecture and 50% practice so that people can really understand. Yep. And like, uh, um, I can also relate to what you said about slowing things down, which always helps uh, the system. It doesn't matter if it's uh, in movement or anything, any other aspect, 
because what people, what we introduce when a new person comes to train and move with us, it's like the, the tempo is super slow. Uh, we focus on detail and we, because you'll see a person like being late for, for, uh, for a session and rushing through and I'm like, okay, first slow down. It doesn't matter that you're late and it doesn't matter that your life is complex and that your systems at work are complex. We try to simplify things down, slow things down for them to have the time to actually sense their movement in their shoulder or their spine or something else, because otherwise their brain is running 100 miles an hour and it's not where it's supposed to be. Even like Ar Arnold Schwarzenegger, he used to talk about my muscle connection and all those kind of things. But this, uh, this, this means that you're there and like, thinking about what you're doing or what you're feeling and all those kind of things. And I, I think for some reason, it's very hard for, for people going through different uh, difficult situations to be honest with themselves and spend time on their own alone with themselves, because this is, this is scary for many people. They, they like being entertained or meet with others just as disguise for issues that they have on their own. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is where support comes in. This is where, you know, after I did three years of somatic experiencing, I was like, okay, it's not enough, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I, I did three years studying the neuroaffective relational model, which has to do with how we develop when we're, when we're young in our families of origin. And, and the reality is, you know, you can be in your thirties or forties or fifties, and there are particular things in us that get touched that touch a younger developmental stage. And so if what's being touched in me is hinging on something that happened when I was three or four years old, the three or four year old is terrified of being alone. So we're not going to sit with it. And that's what people don't understand in the self-help field is that so much of what's being touched and awakened in difficult situations is actually an older time. And if that older time is there, it's like a little time capsule it becomes really hard to be with. And that's when another person or a group of people come in to support you. And then the three-year-old or the four-year-old in us can, ah, right, can take a breath and can process with support. Because when we're young, we need adults around us to process our emotions, especially if it's a big emotional experience. And what are people really afraid of? They're afraid of the emotion overwhelming them. And they're afraid that it doesn't feel good in the body. Like no one's afraid of falling in love. Well, they're afraid for other reasons, but like falling in love feels good, right? It's like, ah, right? It's like, woo, oxytocin, it's beautiful. There's dopamine. Dopamine is insanity. Like oxytocin comes later, but it's like, mm -hmm. like it just feels so amazing. Yeah, I'm in love again. I'm alive. Yeah, you're alive. You're high on dopamine, <laughs> right? Everybody wants that, but nobody really wants to grieve. Nobody really wants to feel the devastation when the Amazon's burning, right? Because it touches places in us where we had loss without support. And that's why it's so important to, like you said, to sit down and journal about difficult experiences because that, that invites your adult presence. I can be an adult with that younger part of me or you can be with a professional who can be that bridge for regulation because humans regulate in connection they don't regulate uh, by themselves. We know how to self-regulate only after we've had the regulation of connection. So developmentally, co-regulation is first and self-regulation is second. And everyone wants to jump into the self-help, but it's together help first and then self-help. Yeah, and they're always in like the self-help kind of field, they talk about... Uh looking looking within and and like everything starts from within yes it's true but if you don't pour stuff in there's no interpretation going on in emotionally if you don't have a reference or a basis to start with because if you don't understand and recognize the emotion or the food or uh when you're first introduced to a new food for example as a young a young kid or um uh, on a cognitive level, again, I talk about movement, but if you don't experience, I remember uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, Chris uh, from Anatomy in Motion was talking about the spinal extension, the true spinal extension. And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. But because I was already good at movement and like uh, I could do bridges and all those kind of things, 
but I was using more muscle than using the spine. And once I was able to get to that point of actually moving my spine and not my muscles and shoulder blades and everything else around there, I'm like, yeah. And then now when I talk to people about it, I'm like, you think you know what you're doing, but you actually don't do it. Uh, so uh, I, I know what you mean. And, and what's helped me, I don't do it on a regular basis, but business-wise and personal, in a, on a personal level, um, I've connected the dots backwards, uh, as Steve Jobs used to say um, in that talk uh, he gave, um, and saw that this happened because of that. And then this experience met me with that person, which led to this and this and this. And, and then you come to realize that things really happen for a reason. There is a pattern. And then the worst thing almost never happens anyway. And then this makes you a little bit uh, braver uh, or not worry so much about making decisions or because you know there's no mistakes their experiences and how you perceive those those experiences and how you interpret it it's it, it's what makes the difference and now nowadays when people uh, ask me how how are you feeling today i'm like great perfect it's, it's a state of mind it doesn't mean i have no problems issues or i, I mean i am uh, i'm not underslept for example with the baby crying all night but it means that my state of mind is more positive and more present and it's not like I'm not playing victim and all those kind of things. It's how I, my brain operates. So yeah, but I, I'm still able to recognize the, the, my different states, but I'm just not expressing it because you know, some people th look for sympathy all the time and they like to play victim for whatever reason. I mean, uh, I understand that it comes from their past, of course, but nobody likes to be around those kind of people. So in order to connect with somebody, it's better to, to say, hey, it's good. And then, and then, yeah, I think it's easier. It makes life better in a yeah. way. I think it's really important what you said about, you know, look within, like looking within, like the in, uh, in biblical speak, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Right? Mm. But that's a spiritual perspective. And I think yep. it's very important when we are learning to see what is the perspective. Is this a spiritual perspective? Is this, a, is this an emotional perspective? Is it a, a mental cognitive perspective? Or, or a subtle energetic perspective, right? Like it, and if you don't know the context within which this is true, it can feel very confusing. And it takes a, a significant amount of internal organization and coherence and actually feeling safe in your body, which means that the autonomic nervous system is functioning. The front part of the vagus nerve is more active. The heart is regulated. We have good heart coherence, right? And as I'm sitting here with you, my heart is not going 120 in, uh, per minute, right? It's maybe going 80, which is more appropriate. Maybe it's going 75, I could measure. But there's, there's a way in which I need a certain amount of autonomic organization on board in order to be able to sit and be still and to look within. Because no one's looking within while they're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger. Yep. Like that's not the time to be looking within. <laughs> yeah. and, no one, and no one's looking within while they are um, in, in daily danger, like whether it's like if there's domestic violence, you're not looking within, you're just trying to get through the day. And I think so often people can feel so guilty and can feel shame that they can't access these high states that everyone out there says you should be able to. But those accessing those high states is a, is a privilege. That's why people go to monasteries because no one's going to bug you there. You know, yep. there's monastery problems, but monastery problems are easier to solve than, than <laughs> you know, the, the ones out in the, in the urban, in, in kind of the, the urban monastery. And so I think in a way it's very important to, to be very specific um, and to like not expect that everything's going to work for everyone because it's like some of your clients don't need spinal extension. Yeah. Yep. And, and, 
And some of them have no idea how to move with impulse. They can only move by being guided. Like me as a dancer, I always had choreography. Like I had no idea how my body wants to move because there's choreography. And then in weightlifting, especially when I got into heavy weights and, and um, kettlebell sport, it's like, there's no improvisation. Like if you're doing a, a, you know, a clean and a jerk, like there's no, like, how does your body want to move? There's like an efficient way for it to move. So you don't <laughs> kill yourself. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so it took me such a long time and I'm still in this process of recovering organic movement um, because I was so, my body was so choreographed. And, and it's the same in, in healing, right? You can search inside yourself. There's a book called that. You can search inside yourself, but you can't search inside yourself before there's a certain level of organization. So what you find is not utter chaos. Yeah. And, and like also with movement, I mean, uh, people want to come and, and they sometimes they post a video or they see a video of some guy who's on a, uh, on a good level about movement and they, they express their mobility and movement and they improvise. And, and then people want to go for that right away, but they like the basics. And I'm like, before we can improvise, we should, as, as, as you said, organize and make sure that we cover the basics because when we give your body the basics and the, the support and the, the, the confidence that, Mm, that it can it can go in in the basic positions then it will allow more movement and then the it, it's like uh, uh, widening the circles like you start from here you're super unaware of what you're doing you're super uh, unconfident and then you're super weak weak and then you start practicing practicing and start widening your widening your horizon movement options and then improvisations happen at least it, it is my experience it happens naturally you don't have to think about it your body just wants to do it like sometimes even in your warm-up you're just like gonna do some limbering and doing stuff not in a structured way or, or as i've done it play some music song and like all of a sudden i'm like going like different like doing movements without any structure so definitely i mean for people who want to it's important to know that you made people who want to improvise and be able to have instant feedback or faster feedback from their different systems they first need to cover the basics yeah yeah and, and a level of organization is really really necessary and you know if if you can take anything away from somatic experiencing and and, and somatic modalities is that whether it's through movement or it's through cognition or through uh, exploring sensation and emotion, there's a reconnection to what the body naturally wants to do, but there's something that's in the way. And our work is to find what's in the way, remove it so that the body can just express more and can kind of rejoin back with what's natural impulse. Um, and it's, and it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to be able to do. Um, and, and I can't stress enough that you, you can't stumble upon it just like you can't stumble upon a handstand, yep. right? It's like, there's, there are particular things in place. There's particular steps that need to be taken safely in order for your body to allow it because so much of what we don't like, I don't like my shoulder tension, or the way that, you know, my tongue swallows or whatever, things that we want to improve are actually compensations that if they could speak, they would say, I am saving your life. <laughs> yep. Like each of them, it's like we're covered in lifesavers. And it's not just going to go away. We need to create the environment for it to say, oh, I don't need to be protecting you anymore because you have access to all this great wonderful whether all this is connection or um it's relationship or it's environment or it's movement or it's an image or it's a, a access to an emotion that you haven't had access to before right yeah huge deal exactly awesome and um what you what you said about um allowing yourself time to self-organize i believe that if we think from the perspective of the situation during the last 
year and a couple of months with all the COVID and people working from home and uh, not going to offices and, and things and people working with you and myself and, and other practitioners online mostly. When we first started, like during the first lockdown last last year in March and May, in April, we did tell our clients that we believe actually this might be a positive thing for themselves because having having them come to the gym and having us guide them and being able to adjust them sometimes even manually or or be like one 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 arm away distance and and them feeling the presence and outsourcing their movement and their thinking pretty much to us, uh, it's sometimes handicapping them. So now being on their own in their safe space in their bedroom would give them more time to explore and to be with their own body with their own experience, which is an important knowledge that, that they need anyway. Because I was just like in a, in a guest in a podcast myself just a couple hours ago and I did and I did uh, tell the story about how I, I started mobility. I was like doing random stuff on my in my living room floor for a good six to eight months. And, I, and then I started to realize that I'm lacking this movement or I got interested in how, on how to improve it. And this led to the next thing and then to the next thing. So it always starts with a little bit of alone time exploration and... It, it to me it's very valuable nowadays my alone time because it it almost never happens nowadays so it, it's super super important yeah that's beautiful i love hearing how you developed it just gives me such joy for well, last question i have because we're uh, a bit short on time um what uh, what would be your advice? I ask this question every every guest. Uh, what would be your advice or advices on how do people start start on a practical level, start improving pieces in their life, well being? Because you know you start asking the right questions and you, you start finding the right teachers, the right answers and stuff. But if if a person is is to start now, what would be let's say top three or top five? small tips that they can start incorporating right away uh, that would give them the biggest bang for their buck? I would say really observing how you use your eyes throughout the day is a very important piece in nervous system regulation because we spend our days on screens and computers and phones and that, they, that narrows the visual field and increases convergence. And that is related to our sympathetic nervous system. So our narrow vision is parvocellular and that goes with sympathetic activation. Um, and if I can open my field and if I can move to a more panoramic vision or more of a peripheral vision, I can look softer, I can look farther. That is associated with the parasympathetic nervous system and our rest and digest mode, and the magnocellular system, which is our emotional processing system. So the more you see how you use your eyes, just observe yourself, then invite yourself to a different experience. This is very challenging for people who wear progressive glasses and it's a great idea to explore how you can shift out of those into two pairs of glasses because otherwise you're stuck in the little eyeball prisons. Mm. So, so really how notice how you use your eyes and allow your eyes to open up to the environment several times a day. That's huge. Another piece, um, really observe what state you're in when you're eating. And I do probably the bulk of my work right now in educating people in nervous system regulation to overcome eating issues and digestive um, and, and digestive system issues, especially people that are on all these special diets and they just don't get better. And one thing you can observe is what state are you in when you're eating? Are you uh, kind of really focused and driven or are you more open and receptive? And you want to be your most soft, open, receptive self you can think about when somebody comes to hug you and you receive their hug or when you hold a baby, you have a little one now, when you hold <laughs> the baby and your body just kind of receives the baby. You're not like 
holding the baby and like pushing it up like a trampoline, right? <laughs> like there's, there's a receiving that happens and really, really important that, that we can receive our nourishment when we eat. And oftentimes we eat in states that are active action states and they're not receptive, restful states. So I would pay attention to that. And a third piece that's really, really important um, is, is really to include more touch in your daily life. Um, you, can, you can touch your body, you can massage your body, you can put on lotion, whatever you prefer. It doesn't have to be like a, a medical massage. Like it doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm doing this lymph drainage. Like it doesn't have to be a specific thing. You can just touch your body. And as simple as crossing your hands and touching your lungs and sitting there for three minutes a day can profoundly shift how you breathe. Just this, because we're crossing the midline and there's particular things that happen um, in cranial nerves and the brain and the lungs that we need another five hours to explain um, that, that really settle the system. And you can comp- you can, you can really just do this or you can cross over to your shoulders. And these self-supportive touch practices are kind of very fundamental in what I teach. And they're really, really important. And if you don't do anything else, if you just work on your um, panoramic peripheral vision, soft vision, if you eat in a receptive state and if you spend some time each day touching your body, your nervous system is gonna start shifting. Um, and, and that's a beautiful thing. And, and none of this is affirmations. None of this is positive thinking. None of this is like, you know, Bruce Willis in Friends. There's this <laughs> awesome episode where he's dating Rachel. He's like in front of the mirror. He's like, I am a neat guy. You know, <laughs> it's not like that at all. It's not like that at all. Our body gets cues of safety from things that are physical And we don't necessarily need to work with um, affirmations and all those things to like psych ourselves into a new state. You cannot heal trauma with motivation. You can only heal it with uh, creating safety and teaching the body that it's safe. Perfect. As usual, it was a pleasure. Uh, so good. And as usual, we could have gone on on and on for like a few more hours. Of course. Uh, uh, but hopefully we're not boring people uh, with uh, with the, the things we're sharing. Ho- hope, I'm hope I'm hoping this was useful and uh, another perspective which you haven't stumbled upon, you haven't uh, um, looked into, uh, but you're you, you're now willing to explore because this is the goal of this podcast: um, uh, introduce uh, different people with different ideas. So once again, Galia, thank you very much for for joining and we hope to continue this sometime in the future thank you so much i appreciate you greatly good luck to you thanks